My name is Soraya, and you are listening to Wild Roots. In this episode, we are going to discuss the origins of coronaviruses with renowned science writer David Quammen. David is the author of multiple books including The Song of the Dodo, The Reluctant Mr. Darwin, The Tangled Tree, and Spillover, Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. In this discussion, David clarifies how zoonotic pathogens exist as part of Earth's naturally diverse biome as well as how human activity often sets loose these viruses from hidden ecological niches in which they naturally exist. Ultimately, human misunderstanding, consumption, and destruction of the natural world is what leads to outbreaks such as the coronavirus global pandemic we are currently all facing. It is ultimately a cause of human exploitation of the natural world that puts us all at risk. It is an undeniable message that we need to protect our natural world. So join us as we explore a better understanding of our greater ecology and the origin of pathogens like the coronavirus. Well, thank you so much, David Kwaman, for speaking with me today to share your thoughts, experience, and your incredible work with us. Happy to be with you, Sarai. So we could probably go down many avenues of the various zoonotic disease origins, but we'll try our best to kind of narrow down our focus to the current coronavirus. I would like for you to start out by giving us an explanation of a couple of terms. First, zoonotic diseases and the term spillover. Right. Yes. Uh, a zoonotic, uh, a zoonosis is an animal infection that's transmissible to humans. A zoonosis could be a virus, could be a bacterium or anything that infects creatures. Uh, when that uh, infectious agent, say it's a virus, uh, when it passes from its natural host, which is usually an animal, a non-human animal, into its first human host, that event is called spillover. And if it establishes a disease in that human and other humans by passing human to human, then we call that a zoonotic disease. So zoonosis is the bug, say it's a virus. Spillover is the moment it passes from non-human animal into human. And zoonotic disease is the disease that it establishes in humans. And 60% of known human infectious diseases are zoonotic diseases in the strict sense, meaning they have come to us from non-human animals within relatively recent times. Right, okay. Um, I wanna talk about the misconceptions. In your investigations, what are some of the common misconceptions people have about these kinds of diseases? Like their origins, evolution, and methods of communicability, for instance? Well, people have a lot of um, understandably inaccurate and sometimes just flat out crazy or paranoid ideas. Uh, for instance, we have heard that um, this latest disease, COVID-19, began with passage of an, a virus probably from a bat into a human uh, in China or from a bat into another animal, probably a larger animal, and, and that it was amplified in that animal the virus, and then into a human. More specifically, we've heard that um, this probably occurred in this uh, 
this live market, what they call a wet market in the city of Wuhan. Uh, I believe the name is the Wanan Wholesale Seafood Market. Um, it carried a whole lot more than seafood. Uh, the wet markets in China, in the periods when they're not heavily regulated or driven underground, they generally contain wild animals caught from the wild of all sorts. Might be civets, might be pangolins, all kinds of wild birds, reptiles, snakes, turtles, amphibians, frogs, um, uh, uh, bamboo rats, and bats. And so we you know this, this virus had its origin in a bat, probably passed in that wild animal market from a bat into a pangolin or a pig or some other creature, larger creature. That creature then was sold or butchered and uh, it dispersed the virus to a number of people. When some people hear that it comes from a bat, they get confused. I had a fellow email me this morning and he said, well, how did it pass from a bat to a human? Uh, did, the, did a bat bite a human? And I said, no, more likely a human bit a bat um, because bats are taken for food in some parts of the world. So that's one kind of misconception. Of course, there are the other more paranoid misconceptions. Oh, we heard that this came from a bioweapons laboratory in uh, China or one that the CIA has been running and it escaped or was released from that weapons laboratory. That's the kind of story for people who who care about excitement but don't really care about science or even about evidence in any sense, because there's plenty of evidence that's that's just not the case. But those kinds of stories, there's an infinite supply of them on the web, and those appeal to people who, because they're angry or confused or feel disempowered or just because they're impatient with reality, they prefer exciting stories to um, stories that are supported by evidence. So maybe we can talk about the differences between a reservoir host versus vectors. And if this coronavirus has a high mutation rate, what are the variables? Yes. All those things you just mentioned are important pieces. Yes. Um, reservoir host. I guess I mentioned that. A reservoir host is the animal that uh, the virus lives in over the long term, uh, inconspicuously, uh, without usually causing symptoms or disease outbreaks in that in that particular species or population of animals. We know that uh, viruses are, are not cellular creatures. The, a virus particle is not a cell. It's just a stretch of genetic uh, molecule, either DNA or RNA, wrapped around in a, in a protein capsule. And it can't reproduce itself independently. It can only get itself reproduced inside the living cell of a cellular creature, animal, plant, uh, fungus, bacteria, whatever. Uh, so uh, a virus that sometimes infects humans and then disappears, we know that that virus has to live in a reservoir host, some other animal probably, um, in which it lurks. And then when we come in contact with that animal, a spillover occurs and it becomes a chain of infection in the human population again. Um, this is more likely to happen if the virus has a high mutation rate. Uh, meaning it makes a lot of mistakes when it copies itself inside that, inside those living cells, uh, copies its, uh, the, it, the, the, the DNA or the RNA code, uh, makes a lot of sort of one letter little mistakes. And each of them represents a, a kind of variation. So if a virus is copying itself inaccurately, it's copying itself with lots of little variations from one virus particle to another. Those virus particles are competing against one another for resources of the cell where they're copying themselves. And, and then when they get out into the bloodstream or whatever of the animal, they're competing more. And when you take a population of variant individuals that are competing against one another with differential success, what does that add up to? Evolution by natural selection, Darwinian evolution. So the, the kinds of viruses that copy themselves inaccurately tend to have much faster rates of evolution and therefore of adaptation to new situations. And at the, among the groups of viruses at the top of the list of mistake-making, fast-evolving viruses, are the coronaviruses.
Um, so when I when I first read that this coronavirus was potentially tied to wildlife trade, I was not at all surprised. And I was going to ask you, which you already kind of mentioned, um, specifically about the ecological origin of the coronavirus. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little more. Right. First of all, the matter of surprise. You weren't surprised. I wasn't surprised. The scientists I talked to weren't surprised. Donald Trump apparently said at his press conference, actually, I saw it this morning. He said, nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw this coming. That's just, yeah. that's a flat lie. Uh, I saw this coming. 10 years ago because I talked to scientists and they saw it coming. Um, they told me, and I, and I put this into my book Spillover, published in 2012, um, based on what I was hearing from scientists, essentially a composite of what they s said when I asked the question, what will the next big one, next big pandemic look like? These scientists essentially told me, well, it'll be a virus. It will come out of an animal, um, probably a wild animal. Oh, very possibly a bat. It'll be one of the fast evolving viruses. Oh, very possibly a coronavirus. Uh, where will it come out of the bat? Oh, someplace where humans come in contact with wild animals. For instance, a wet market. Uh, for instance, in China. Mm -hmm. Eight years ago, I was saying that based on what I was hearing from the experts. So we did see this coming. Um, the 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 politicians and the people who control the machinery of government just didn't want to take the risk of spending a lot of money to prepare for right. it. Um, remind me the second part of your question. Um, it was uh, just elaborating on the specifics of the ecological origin of yeah, this yeah. strain. Well, I could say a little bit more about this particular coronavirus. When it first appeared back in, when we first became aware of it back in January, China was aware of it in December, but the rest of us became aware of it in, in January. Um, they were calling it the novel coronavirus. I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times uh, that ran, I think, January 28th. And I think in that I said, well, this is, that's ironic you call it novel coronavirus, but because in a lot of ways this is not new. It's a new strain of coronavirus. Um, it's different from the coronavirus that caused, caused the SARS uh, outbreak in 2002 and 2003, but it belongs to the same family, coronaviruses. And we knew that this was one of the kinds of viruses most likely to cause the next pandemic. This particular one, uh, the um, Chinese scientists isolated the virus, grew the virus, sequenced the genome of the virus, and that became available around January 22nd, as I recall. And um, scientists began looking at it, and they immediately said, well, this is different enough from the SARS virus that it doesn't seem to be a direct evolutionary descendant or variant of that, but it closely matches this other coronavirus that we found about five years ago in bats in a cave in the province of Yunnan, not Hubei, China, where Wuhan is. So there was this match coming from scientists, some of them at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, some of them international collaborators, such as Peter Daszak, president of the EcoHealth Alliance based in New York. And they were saying, look, this is, this is like 98% similar to the Yunnan virus that we published a paper on three years ago. And that one was found in horseshoe bats in that cave in Yunnan. So there's a good chance this one came from horseshoe bats also. So that's the chain of evidence there. Interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm hoping to be able to speak with Peter as well. Peter is a guy and a very important player, a great yes. guy, very important, very important figure in this whole field. Absolutely. Um, in the recent article, uh, in the New York Times article titled, We Made the Coronavirus Epidemic, you said, quote, we cut down trees, we kill the animals or cage them and send them to markets. We disrupt ecosystems and we shake viruses loose from their natural host. When that happens, they need a new host and often we are it. Um, so the article is based around the fact that despite the remoteness of the origin of the current coronavirus, human activity is absolutely what set in motion this epidemic, now a pandemic. Can you elaborate on, on that? Um, yes, um, there at the at the base of all of this is human population, human consumption, and human 
disruption of diverse ecosystems. And as I said in that Times op-ed, and as I also said in my book eight years ago, um, the ultimate cause is that there are more and more of us humans going into wild, diverse ecosystems, cutting cutting down the trees, building timber camps, building mining camps, um, killing the wild animals for food or capturing them and then shipping them away to be sold as food somewhere else. Um, and as we do that, we we shake loose or rattle loose these viruses. That's my my metaphor. We expose ourselves to these viruses that come from non-human animals. And we offer viruses the opportunity of a new kind of host. Um, we and, and sometimes a virus is able to seize that opportunity. Viruses don't have purposes. They don't seek us out. They don't want to jump into humans. But, um, uh, but they are creatures subject to evolution, and therefore they seize opportunity. Um, and so if a virus seizes the opportunity to take hold in a human, finds that it can... Uh, it can it can um, enter human cells. It can replicate itself in human cells. It can come busting out as a hundred virus particles instead of just the one that went in. And 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 then if it finds it can evolve further so that it can disperse from one human and infect another, for instance, by in, uh, in building up in the uh, in, uh, in the respiratory tract uh, and and come flying out when the person coughs and get into another person's respir respiratory tract, then, um, then it has succeeded in, in establishing a new host. And if it does that in the human population, then it's hit the jackpot uh, because there are 7.7 .7 billion of us and we're closely interconnected, uh, exposing one another to our, our microbes every day. Right. So I really, really would want to stress how understanding ecology phylogenetics and evolutionary biology better is truly helpful in understanding these pathogens and are helpful with keeping them at bay. Um, that understanding of our interconnected nature with non-human animals is what I find so incredibly important. Um, so can you sort of paint a picture of just how incredibly intertwined we are with the ecology and the health of non-human animals? Yes, and you're absolutely right, Soraya. Uh, this is all about ecology and evolutionary biology and uh, taxono taxonomy and classification to some extent, but ecology yes. and evolutionary biology. I've written uh, nonfiction for, I don't know, 30 or 35 years now, and mostly my subject area has been ecology, evolutionary biology, and conservation. Uh, awesome. And, and that's, what I, that's what I know. Uh, I know it from on-the-job training, not from academic training. But that's what's familiar to me. I've written a lot about Charles Darwin, a lot about evolution, and a fair amount about ecology. And the reason I got interested in scary viruses, emerging infectious diseases, zoonotic uh, uh, pathogens, was because after a, a little bit of exposure to it, I realized this is all this is all ecology and evolutionary biology. This is the ecology and evolutionary biology of scary viruses. They, as I've said, they don't have purpose, but they are, they are ecological and evolutionary entities. Whether or not you call them live or not, that's kind of a semantic distinction because they have, they have genomes, um, they have DNA or RNA genomes using the same genetic codes, code that every other creature on the planet, with tiny, tiny special exceptions, uses. So um, we know that they are part of the living ecosystem uh, matrix of planet Earth and uh, because they replicate with variation and are subject to natural selection, they evolve. So the question is, um, viewed from the point of view of a virus, where do you live? How do you make a living? How do you deal with change? How do you deal with adversity? How do you seize our opportunity? Think about it from the point of view of the virus. You can see these things um, with a certain special clarity. And um, for instance, uh, say there's a virus that's living in chimpanzees in Central Africa. Let's call this SIV to stand for simian immunodeficiency virus. And it's a retrovirus 
and slowly it causes immune systems in chimpanzees to fail. Okay, the virus is living there. Um, chimpanzees are on, sadly, on the decrease during the 19th and 20th century because humans are destroying so much of their habitat and are even killing chimpanzees for food, which people have done and continue to do in parts of Africa. Uh, so now imagine one chimpanzee in the southeastern corner of Cameroon in Central Africa. Oh, back around 1908. Um, and this, ch this chimpanzee happens to carry the SIV virus, this chimpanzee in the southeastern corner of Cameroon living in a forest. Uh, but it, say it's not showing any symptoms. It, it has no awareness of, uh, of, of having troubles. Um, and then it gets caught in a snare that a human has set. Uh, and it's stuck. And then the human comes out of the forest with a machete and the chimpanzee struggles desperately and the human kills it with the machete. Maybe the human, the chimpanzee bites the human a few times on the hands or the arms, maybe even tears a wound in it. Um, and then the human takes his machete and he butchers that chimpanzee for meat. In the course of doing that, he gets some of the chimpanzee blood into those cuts on his arm that the chimpanzee has caused. And then the human goes away happily meet, and he lives his life for 10 years, uh, and he has sexual relationships. Maybe, you know, he's living in a village or the edge of a village in southeastern Cameroon. His options probably aren't very broad. His, his interactions aren't broad. So maybe he has, you know, sexual relations with maybe five women over the course of the next 10 years. And uh, one of those women picks up this virus that the human has been carrying since that blood-to-blood -blood contact, and now the woman is carrying too, formerly called SIV in retrospect, but now it's human virus, and we call it in retrospect HIV. That, what I've just described, is known by, by inference. Parts of it are known by molecular biology, and parts of it are, are established are, are proposed by inference. That is the scenario for the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. And I put this is in my book. There's a long chapter devoted to the ecological origins of the AIDS pandemic. And we know from good molecular work by a couple of people, Beatrice Hahn, then at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, Michael Warby at the University of Arizona in Tucson, we know from their the work by them and their colleagues that this is what happened, that the first spillover of the pandemic strain of HIV um, happened in the southeastern corner of Cameroon. This is Beatrice's work, Hans' work. Um, southeastern corner of Cam Cameroon, a chimpanzee virus spilled over into humans and became um, HIV-1, group M, the pandemic strain. And from Michael Warby's work, we know that occurred in 1908, give or take a margin of error, at the very beginning of the 20th century. So there's a story very, very different from what most people think they know about the origins of AIDS. Absolutely, but, which is why I wanted to cover misconceptions, because they are ultimately very harmful. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, um, so then what happens? Well, uh, the virus develops slowly and causes disease slowly and it has imperfect transmission, but over the course of decades, it passes from one person to another in southeastern Cameroon, by my hypothesis, down the Ngoko River to the to the Sangha River, down the Sangha River to the main stem Amazon, uh, where it comes to what? It comes to two big cities, Brazzaville in what then was um, French Congo, and what then was Leopoldville in Belgian Congo, now the city of Kinshasa, capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it probably got to those two cities sometime in the early mid 20th century. And then there was greater population density, um, uh, looser sexual mores. Um, people were treating, uh, there were clinics treating venereal disease using, um, using uh, hypodermic needles that were uh, not disposable. They were rinsing them out between um, injections. And uh, so that is probably what jump-started the AIDS pandemic. If you want just the, the AIDS story, uh, it's 
it's a it's a hundred page chapter or section in this in spillover my large book but it's also been published independently by my publisher as a short book with a new introduction self-contained as the chimp and the river so that's what that's that's the short that short 100 120 pages short version of this ecological story of the origins of aids the chimp and the river great thank you for sharing that resource um again i really want to pass on the message that um, in terms of the coronavirus, um, this kind of occurrence happens because of an enormous misunderstanding of our greater ecology and our relationship to that ecology. But also I want to bring attention to the demonization of wildlife because they happen to be natural reservoirs, um, which leads to you know erroneous efforts to try to eradicate entire species out of this irrational fear. And of course this is extremely disappointing because it undermines our own ecology. So let's let's talk about that and the importance right. of biodiversity. And, and the importance of not demonizing uh, other species. Well, that's the uh, that conversation probably should begin with bats uh, because bats do seem to be overrepresented as reservoir hosts of these dangerous new viruses that are getting into humans. And we can talk if you want about why they seem to be overrepresented. But bats, bats, bats. Bats are the reservoir host of Marburg virus. Bats with this new virus. Bats are the reservoir host of uh, SARS coronavirus and uh, Hendra virus in Australia and Nipah virus in Malaysia and Bangladesh. Bats, bats, bats. So I write about them. Uh, again, there's a long chapter uh, in spillover about the question why bats but even without addressing the question why bats um, it's important to address the question of well so what do we do with that information that bats are or seem to be overrepresented as reservoir hosts and I have to I have to remind myself to add what seems to me too obvious to say and that is well the solution is not well let's kill the bats let's get rid of the bats no that's not the solution the solution is leave bats the hell alone mm -hmm. nature because has we its own bats. checks and balances and just needs to remain undisturbed that's right and bats perform important ecological service services bats mm -hmm. Bats eat a lot of insects, including mosquitoes, that otherwise would be tormenting humans more than they already are. Bats pollinate different kinds of plants. Bats are really important parts of our forests. So um, we do not want to demonize bats. We do not want to demonize spiders. We do not even want to demonize mosquitoes, which people sometimes do. Which, by mosquitoes, the way, are just vectors. Mosquitoes right? are just vectors, exactly, exactly. Um, Mosquitoes don't cause malaria. The malarial parasite causes malaria. Um, mosquitoes deliver the parasite. They are vectors, as you said. Um, and uh, But mosquitoes get infected with malaria um, by biting humans, just the way humans get infect with, infected with malaria by being bitten. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I suppose, I suppose we don't want to even demonize the malarial parasite, uh, but that's... That's really where this becomes philosophically challenging yeah. and a very interesting yeah. conversation. Just as the discussion about the smallpox virus became an interesting philosophical discussion, when the smallpox virus was reduced to just a few frozen samples in laboratories around the world and people argued about whether those samples should be destroyed so that smallpox virus would cease to exist on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were you going to say? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, just that's the takeaway I want for the world, you know, is that there's these ecological niches everywhere and we're just a part of it and it all needs to be there in some form or, or another um, mm -hmm. to keep these checks and balances in place and to keep things such as the coronavirus from spilling over. Um, that's right. Yeah. It's such a hard message to sell. I mean, it doesn't seem hard to maybe you or me or other biologists or whatever, but it's just so seemingly abstract to so many people, and it's it's just so frustrating. Yes, it is. Why do we need, um, you know, why do we need a million species, a million different species of beetles? Uh, well, we don't know why, um, but we probably do. We shouldn't uh, assume that any one of those uh, species of beetles is completely unnecessary to lots of other aspects of our diverse tropical ecosystems that we might not know about yet. It's the cautionary principle. Uh, Absolutely. Um, so the next 
uh, topic I want to talk about might seem obvious, but um, let's run through it anyway. Um, uh, Homo sapiens. Um, the human population is sort of out of balance when compared to other species just by mm -hmm. sheer size. It's disproportionate to the ecology we are a part of. And on top of this, uh, humans are the prime cause of biodiversity decline, and we are paying the consequences. Um, not sometime in the future, but right now. Um, it's interesting as a biologist, and we, we, we get taught the, that these things uh, could happen and not, you know, not if, but when, and it is happening, and it's just incredibly mind-blowing to be in this right now. Um, but amidst what we are experiencing, um, what does the sheer size of our population tell us about what can happen? Well, first of all, I agree with everything you just said. Um, secondly, the sheer size of our population. Um, I think one of the things that um, is important to bring to people's attention, uh, and, and many people have just never, it hasn't occurred to them, is that there are how many of us? 7.7 .7 billion humans going going on 7.8 billion, I think, at this point. Um, and uh, we are large-bodied creatures. You know, we tend to weigh between 100 pounds and 250 pounds, most of us. Uh, there has never been a single species of animal in the history of planet Earth with body size that large that has been anywhere near as abundant as we are. Yes, there were big dinosaurs, lots of big dinosaurs, but 7.7 .7 billion individuals of Tyrannosaurus rex, no. We know from the fossil record that there has never been any single species as abundant at the body size that we have as we are. So this is an unprecedented event already, just the fact that there are 7.7 .7 billion of us large-bodied creatures. Add to that the fact that we're very smart, um, we're uh, very uh, hungry, we're very demanding on um, comfort and the availability of new things, and products, consumption, not just subsistence consumption, but luxury. We have, to a great degree, we have invented wealth and luxury. And so we are drawing on the rest of the natural world at an absolutely unprecedented pace. And so it's not just people in China who want to eat a pangolin or a bat who are responsible for pandemics. It's all of us. Right. It's consumption it's habits. Right. Consumption habits, the decisions that we make, the decision on, on what to consume and how much of it, the decision on how much to travel and where, the decision on how many children we're gonna have, if we have any children, all of those are things that affect uh, our standing remnants of biological diversity. For instance, cell phones. If we want a cell phone, we need to remember that there's a mineral in there, I believe it's called coltan. 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 Right, yeah, you're onto this already, you know where I'm going with this. And so, um, so there are mines in the Congo um, for coltan. And those mines employ workers and those workers have to eat something. What are they eating? Well, I haven't been to any of those mines. I've been to other, you know, mining sites in, in diverse tropical forests in Africa and elsewhere. Um, the workers have to uh, have to eat and generally the workers are fed on bushmeat, wildlife in the surrounding areas that are killed. So by having a cell phone, I am, you are contributing to the bushmeat trade and the, and the prospect of new um, zoonoses, new spillovers of dangerous new viruses. We yeah. are all a part of that problem. And that reality is just, it's just so stark. And um, I, I have a hard time just even articulating how living in these times makes me feel. Um, but 
Um, we're not going to go into that. So I want to talk about the differences between diseases that can be eradicated, like say smallpox or something like that versus mm -hmm. zoonotic diseases. Sure. Yes. Yes. Why? Why can some diseases be eradicated and some cannot? Smallpox can be eradicated. It exists only now in those frozen samples, which by the way, have not been destroyed. They still exist in those freezers for research and, uh, and, uh, the, and the possibility that they might be needed for creation of a, of a vaccine in the future if somebody else seems to be, happens to be hiding a sample of, of smallpox virus and releases it as a bioweapon. Anyway, so smallpox can be eradicated from the human population. Polio, we've been very, very close to eradicating polio from the human population, and that essentially has been stopped by politics and religion um, and suspicion of polio workers who, in some of the cases where polio um, uh, persists, uh, polio um, uh, caseworkers have been have been targeted and even kidnapped and killed. Uh, but polio can be eradicated. Smallpox has been eradicated. Why? Because they are not zoonotic diseases. There is no animal host anymore for those particular viruses because they have been in humans so long that they evolved have evolved away from a wild strain. Uh, in whatever animal we got them from, and they have become new independent disease, uh, disease uh, pathogens that exist only in the human population. So if we get rid of them from the human population, they're gone. With a, with a zoonotic disease, with this new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, or with the original SARS virus, or with Ebola, we know that if we, if we, if we, bring an outbreak or an epidemic to a close and we cure all the humans or they die and it no longer exists, it's no longer transmitting from human to human, we still know that the virus is out there somewhere. It's hiding. It's in its reservoir host, in that forest or in that cave, wherever, and it can come back. Exactly. So zoonotic pathogens are a part of our greater ecology and we need to remember yes, that. Yes, they are. So what can you tell us about just how incredibly important those jobs are of those individuals such as disease ecologists who actually venture out into the remote field to hunt down the origins of these zoonotic pathogens. That's much of what my book Spillover is about. I spent five years on the book. I spent a lot of time following um, these disease detectives into the wild, um, crawling into uh, bat caves in southern China. Um, uh, going into um, bat colonies in uh, Bangladesh uh, and Malaysia, um, going into the Congo forest uh, uh, to tranquilize gorillas and take blood samples from gorillas looking for, um, hoping to find antibodies to Ebola. Uh, these are uh, uh, amazing people. It's an incredible guild of people who do this disease detecting work, yes. the field work. Uh, generally, they have, um, they have cross-training. Um, they typically might have a PhD in ecology, plus a master's in public health, plus maybe a medical degree, um, or a, another PhD in virology. Combination of skills, and a combination of skills, great curiosity, and courage, and a desire to do important work. Um, so some of them work for the EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Dashak's group. I haven't been in the field with Peter, but I spent time with Peter. I, Peter and I stay in pretty close touch during a time like this. Um, some of the people in his organization, such as Jonathan Epstein and Alexi Kamura, are the people that I've gone into the wild with. Oh, and also now Billy Karish, the great Dr. Billy Karish, uh, who used to be with a different organization, but now he's also part of EcoHealth Alliance. I went with Billy vaccinating chickens in Cambodia on the Vietnamese border at the time when bird flu was a concern. And I also went with, he was the one that I went with to the Congo forest that particular time um, to tranquilize gorillas and try and, try and tranquilize gorillas and, and uh, get blood samples to see if they, they were carrying Ebola antibodies. Interestingly, when, when I went with Billy on that trip, uh, we went to uh, the Republic of Congo um, to a remote um, clearing on the upper Mambili River. Uh, uh, and in this clearing, a natural clearing in the forest, there had been a big population of gorillas using that natural clearing because there are special 
um, special um, sedges and forbs and edible vegetation that grow in this sunlit clearing. And there were uh, a lot of gorillas, uh, I think around 100 gorillas who frequently used that clearing. Uh, and then an Ebola outbreak had struck in 1996, and not far from there. And Ebola kills chimps and gorillas as well as humans, so that we know that chimps or gorillas can't be the reservoir host of Ebola, whatever that reservoir right. is, because because they're too susceptible to it. So we wanted to go back to that spot where where Ebola had struck the gorilla population, find the surviving gorillas, tranquilize dart them, and see if they had survived the virus exposed and, and developing antibodies. We got there, we spent eight days in that in that forest area camping and going out in each day. Billy had his uh, air gun to shoot tranquilizer darts. And we didn't get a single gorilla. I didn't see a single gorilla and Billy saw one. Uh, and the, the conclusion was they, they were all, they had been all killed by the Ebola outbreak or the remainders had run away in terror. And this great gorilla that was now empty of gorillas. Well, you brought up something that I'm very curious about and maybe you have some answers on this, but of creating vaccines for the actual the reservoir species is that really feasible um like like for bats for instance um, i mean is it is that a really feasible way to to deal with these pathogens i think that it's something that's worth trying but it's very difficult it's difficult to vaccinate a wild animal population because um, obviously you can't catch them all and and you know give them a shot in the arm um, so generally it's it's attempted using um uh using pelts pellets of feed, pellets of attractive feed that contain some sort of an oral vaccine. This has been done with, um, with the problem of rabies in, I think, raccoons and skunks in the southeastern U.S. There's a lot of rabies um, virus circulating in rac raccoons and I think also skunks in the southeastern U.S. It's a real problem. It's it's bad for the, the raccoon population because it kills them, and it's bad for humans, too, because it's a danger to them if they have contact with a raccoon. Um, so people have tried to vaccinate them, um, by not by shooting them with darts, but by putting out, you know, treats, and the treats are laced with, um, with oral vaccine. And I think there's been some success. And there, is, there, is, there have been attempts now to develop that kind of a vaccine against Ebola, um, that could be used um, on potentially uh, to protect gorilla and chimpanzee populations, and it's related. It's related to the work that has been done um, to uh, develop a vaccine against Ebola that can be used for people too. Uh, to do rings vaccinations when there's an outbreak of Ebola in a village, the idea is to come in, and this has been going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo over the last year or more. Uh, yeah. Trying to, they've had an Ebola outbreak, and they've been trying to use ring vaccinations to uh, protect people in the adjacent areas. So to use treats to uh, to vaccinate um, oral vaccinate raccoons uh, to decrease the rabies prevalence in raccoons, which saves raccoons as well as people, that does not seem to me uh, unacceptably intrusive. No, it doesn't. That's, that's very interesting. It's very fascinating, actually. Um, well, David, is there anything else you might like to add before we close up here with our last question? There is one more thing. Um, now we're in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, and people are being told uh, social distancing. Um, don't go to bars. Don't go to restaurants. Don't go even don't go to the park and hang out with your 11 best friends standing in a circle and talking at each other because you not only endanger, endanger your grandparents, you endanger anybody else you come, come into contact with, even uh, tangentially. Um, so don't do that. OK, I, we're, I, my wife and I are not doing that. Um, and we're social distancing. But I think it's also important for people to remember that we're social distancing. Right. That's good. But social distancing need to mean emotional distancing. We need to stay connected to one another in some way. So the internet was invented for this situation. So use Skype, 
uh, use Zoom, use Google Hangouts uh, to, to stay connected with one another, even in groups. Your book club can still meet. Just do it with Zoom or Google Hangouts and talk to one another and ask one another how you're doing, how are you doing, uh, and, and, and stay connected as much as possible, just not with physically close proximity. Right. Thank you so much, David, for that, that clarification. That I think so many people um, need to hear that. And my last question is if you could share a story about a special connection or experience that you have made in nature or with an animal. Hmm. Well, there are so many. There's so many. Um, decades ago, when I was living in Tucson um, in a rented house and starting to write essays for Outside Magazine, I was writing a column, natural science column for Outside Magazine. Uh, at one point uh, in, in Tucson, uh, in those parts of the country, black widows are pretty common. Black widows are still dangerous animals. You know, if you if you bump up against one, uh, a big female black widow might well bite you. She doesn't have any real reason to bite you, but she might bite you anyway. You know, she's, uh, she doesn't use her um, her venom for defense. She uses it for killing her prey. Uh, but you could get bit by a black widow. So I'm working at my desk and uh, in Tucson. And I noticed there's a black widow egg case underneath the desk, not too far from my knee. And I, first it's just a spider egg case, but uh, I think I, if I remember correctly, I see, I see the female. Uh, maybe I carry her outside in a jar. I don't think I kill her. Um, and then I come back into my office one evening after dinner, and there are hundreds of tiny, tiny baby black widows all over my desk and belaying off my tensor lamp and floating through the air on threads of silk because this case has hatched out. And each of these is smaller than a poppy seed. These tiny, tiny little black widows. But I know that's what they are because I've seen the female. And now I have a moral challenge. What am I going to do about 150 baby black widows, each the size smaller than a poppy seed. Am I going to carry each of them outside in a jar? How am I going to do that? So I have this moral dilemma, and um, and I kill them all. I kill them all with a can of Raid. Am I proud of that? No. But what was important about that? Well, what was important is that I thought about that, and I still remember that 35 years later. That was a yeah. moment when I wasn't able to give them forgiveness and tolerance and a little bit of slack. And I'm a, I'm a recovering arachnophobe. I love snakes and I flinch at spiders. Although, uh, although intellectually I'm not, I'm not scared of spiders, um, but I'd have that flinch response, which some people do. Even Ed Wilson, the great E.O. Wilson, who's a friend of mine, he is also a natural arachnophobe who loves snakes. So I'm, I'm in good company. Um, so why, why am I telling this story? Well, because I wrote a piece about it for Outside. I think the piece ran probably in about 1984. It was entitled, I think, uh, uh, I can't remember what it was entitled, but it's in one of my collected books, collected essays books somewhere. can't remember what it's entitled, but it's something about spider face, not, uh, and black widows. Anyway, it's, a, it's, about black widows, but it includes this anecdote. And it includes the fact that I know that I failed that night. I knew that I failed again. I don't practice perfect ahimsa. I am not a vegan. Well, I'm a vegan about four nights a week. Um, but um, I have other um, things that I can be called to account for in terms of my relationship with the natural world and animals in particular. Um, but I have tried to be very, very gentle with spiders ever since then, because even though I have a cringe response to a creature that has eight eyes, um, I know that almost all, cre all spiders are completely harmless, and all spiders have their role, just the way bats have their role, and just the way snakes, like the beautiful snake that lives in a tank in my office here, 
six feet from where I'm sitting right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have roles. And by the way, he's not a capture. He's a, he's a rescue. Um, uh, I know that they have their roles. And so um, ever since then, I have tried to be especially um, forgiving uh, and considerate of spiders. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, I would love people to remember those defining moments that remind us unquestionably that we are a part of the greater ecology. And in your story, it is the knowledge, having the knowledge that these individual species have their place here in the natural world alongside all of us. The last thing we need is for people to become even more biophobic because at this point, uh, more loss of biodiversity is high stakes for humanity. Again, David, thank you so much. It was a pleasure speaking with you. You're very welcome, Soraya. Very good to talk this afternoon. This outbreak shines a very stark light on our broken relationship with the rest of the living natural world. The best way to protect ourselves and other species from future pandemics like this one is to protect the living natural world. Biodiversity gives us resiliency. The more sound and healthy our greater ecology is, the better off we all are. Leaving the natural world to its own agency allows nature's checks and balances to keep things such as the coronavirus from spilling over. We don't know how fast this coronavirus's mutation rate is, but in that fact alone, we may just have one more chance to change things. To get through this and to prevent future outbreaks, we gotta do this right. I know that's possible for us, but it is past the time we need to turn towards nature as our ally, to pay attention, and never forget the living world beyond ourselves. I wish you all health and resiliency. And remember, stay diligent, follow the recommended expert advice to stay healthy and to keep those around you safe. This is Wild Roots. Thanks for listening.